Mathematics is about solving problems. And it's the great unsolved problems that make maths really alive. In the summer of 1900, the International Congress of Mathematicians was held here in Paris in the Sorbonne. It was a pretty shambolic affair, not helped by the sultry August heat. But it will be remembered as one of the greatest congresses of all time, thanks to a lecture given by the up-and-coming David Hilbert. Hilbert, a young German mathematician, boldly set out what he believed were the 23 most important problems for mathematicians to crack. He was trying to set the agenda for 20th century maths, and he succeeded. These Hilbert problems would define the mathematics of the modern age. Of those who tried to crack Hilbert's challenges, some would experience immense triumphs, whilst others would be plunged into infinite despair. The first problem on Hilbert's list emerged from here, Halle in East Germany. It was where the great mathematician George Cantor spent all his adult life, and where he became the first person to really understand the meaning of infinity and give it mathematical precision. The statue in the town square, however, honours Halle's other famous son, the composer George Handel. To discover more about Cantor, I had to take a tram way out of town. For 50 years, Halle was part of communist East Germany, and the communists loved celebrating their scientists, so much so that they put Cantor on the side of a large cube that they commissioned. But being communists, they didn't put the cube in the middle of the town, they put it out amongst the people. When I eventually found the estate, I started to fear that maybe I got the location wrong. I must say this looks the most unlikely venue for a statue to a mathematician. Excuse me. Uh, I'm Fraga. Can you help me a bit? Do you speak English? No. No, no. Ich suche eine Würfel. Ein Würfel, yeah. Is that right? A Würfel? A, a cube? Yeah. yeah, like that? Mit ein Ab... Bindung der Mathematica. Yeah, go around there. Die Name ist Cantor. Somewhere over here. Oh, there it is! It's actually much bigger than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be something like this sort of size. Aha! Here we are. On the dark side of the cube. Uh, here's the man himself, Cantor. Cantor was one of my big heroes, actually. I think uh, if I had to choose some theorems that I wish I'd proved, um, I think uh, the couple that Cantor proves would be up there in my top ten. And this is because, before Cantor, no one had really understood infinity. It was a tricky, slippery concept that didn't really seem to go anywhere. But Cantor showed that infinity could be perfectly understandable. Indeed, there wasn't just one infinity, but infinitely many infinities. First, Cantor took the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Then he thought about comparing them with a much smaller set, something like 10, 20, 30, 40. What he showed is that these two infinite sets of numbers actually have the same size because we can pair them up, 1 with 10, 2 with 20, 3 with 30, and so on. So these are the same sizes of infinity. But what about the fractions? After all, there are infinitely many fractions between any of the two whole numbers. So surely the infinity of fractions is much bigger than the infinity of whole numbers. Well, what Cantor did was to find a way to pair up all of the whole numbers with an infinite load of fractions. And this is how he did it. He started by arranging all the fractions in an infinite grid. The first row contained the whole numbers, fractions with one on the bottom. In the second row came the halves, fractions with two on the bottom, and so on. Every fraction appears somewhere in this grid. Where's two thirds? Second column, third row. Now imagine a line snaking back and forward diagonally through the fractions. 
by pulling this line straight, we can match up every fraction with one of the whole numbers. This means the fractions are the same sort of infinity as the whole numbers. So perhaps all infinities have the same size. Well, here comes the really exciting bit, because Cantor now considers the set of all infinite decimal numbers. And here he proves that they give us a bigger infinity, because however you try to list all the infinite decimals, Cantor produced a clever argument to show how to construct a new decimal number that was missing from your list. Suddenly, the idea of infinity opens up. There are different infinities, some bigger than others. It's a really exciting moment. For me, this is like the first humans understanding how to count things. But now we're counting in a different way. We're counting infinities. A door has opened and an entirely new mathematics lay before us. But it never helped Cantor much. I was in the cemetery in Halle, where he's buried, and where I'd arranged to meet Professor Joe Dorban. He was keen to make the connections between Cantor's maths and his life. He suffered from uh, manic depression. One of the first big breakdowns he has is in 1884. Right. Um, but then around the turn of the century, these recurrences of the mental illness become more and more frequent. A lot of people have tried to make out that his mental illness was somehow triggered by the incredible abstract mathematics that he was dealing with. Well, he was certainly struggling, so there may I have mean, been it is, a connection. Yeah, I mean, I must say, you know, when I'm... Uh, when you start to contemplate the infinite, you know, I mean, I'm pretty happy with sort of the bottom end of the infinite. Mm -hmm. But as you kind of build it up more and more, I, I must say, I start to feel unnerved by quite um, what's going on here and where is it going. For much of Cantor's life, the only place it was going was here, the university's sanatorium. There was no treatment then for manic depression, or indeed for the paranoia that often accompanied Cantor's attacks. Yet the clinic was a good place to be, comfortable, quiet and peaceful. And Cantor often found his time here gave him the mental strength to resume his exploration of the infinite. Other mathematicians would be bothered by the paradoxes that Cantor's work had created. Curiously, this was the one thing Cantor was not worried by. He was never as upset about the paradoxes of the infinite as everybody else was. Oh, because, really? <laughs> because Cantor believed that, all right, there are certain things that I've been able to show we can establish with complete mathematical certainty. And then the absolute infinite, which is only in God, he can understand all of this. And there's still that final paradox that is not given to us to understand, but God does. But there was one problem that Cantor couldn't leave in the hands of the Almighty, a problem he wrestled with for the rest of his life. It became known as the continuum hypothesis. Is there an infinity sitting between the smaller infinity of all the whole numbers and the larger infinity of the decimals? Cantor's work didn't go down well with many of his contemporaries. But there was one mathematician from France who spoke up for him, arguing that Cantor's new mathematics of infinity was beautiful, if pathological. Fortunately, this mathematician was the most famous and respected mathematician of his day. When Bertrand Russell was asked by a French politician who he thought the greatest man France had produced, he replied without hesitation, Poincaré. The politician expressed surprise that he'd chosen the Prime Minister, Raymond Poincaré, above the likes of Napoleon, Balzac. Russell replied, I don't mean Raymond Poincaré, but his cousin, the mathematician, Henri Poincaré. Henri Poincaré spent most of his life in Paris, a city that he loved, even with its uncertain climate. In the last decades of the 19th century, Paris was a centre for world mathematics, and Poincaré became its leading light. Algebra, geometry, analysis, he was good at everything. His work would lead to all kinds of applications, from finding your way around on the underground, to new ways of predicting the weather. Poincaré was very strict about his working day. Two hours of work in the morning and two hours of work in the early evening. It was in between these periods that he would let his subconscious carry on working on the problem. He recalls one moment when he had a flash of inspiration, which occurred to him almost out of nowhere, just as he was getting on a bus. 
and one such flash of inspiration led to an early success. In 1885, King Oscar II of Sweden and Norway offered a prize of 2,500 crowns for anyone who could establish mathematically once and for all whether the solar system would continue turning like clockwork or might suddenly fly apart. If the solar system has two planets, then Newton had already proved that their orbits would be stable. The two bodies just travel around in ellipses around each other. But as soon as you add three bodies like the Earth, Moon and Sun, the question of whether their orbits were stable or not stumped even the great Newton. The problem is that now you have some 18 different variables, like the exact coordinates of each body and their velocity in each direction, so the equations become very difficult to solve. But Poincaré made significant headway in sorting them out. Poincaré simplified the problem by making successive approximations to the orbits, which he believed wouldn't affect the final outcome significantly. Although he couldn't solve the problem in its entirety, his ideas were sophisticated enough to win him the prize. He developed this great sort of arsenal of techniques, um, mathematical techniques, which um, in order to try and solve it. And in fact, the, the prize that he won was essentially really more for the techniques than for solving the problem. But when Poincaré's paper was being prepared for publication by the King's scientific advisor, Mittag Leffler, one of the editors found a problem. Poincaré realised that he'd made a mistake. Contrary to what he'd originally thought, even a small change in the initial conditions could end up producing vastly different orbits. His simplification just didn't work. But the result was even more important. The orbits Poincaré had discovered indirectly led to what we now know as chaos theory. Understanding the mathematical rules of chaos explain why a butterfly's wings could create tiny changes in the atmosphere that ultimately might cause a tornado or a hurricane to appear on the other side of the world. Um, so this big subject of the 20th Pacific. century, chaos, yes. actually came out of a, a mistake Eight. that, <laughs> that Poincaré had only spotted at the last yes. minute. And so the, the essay had actually been published in its original form and was ready to go out. I mean, and in fact, Mittag had sent copies out to various people and it was to his horror when Poincaré wrote to him and said, you know, you know, stop, you know. Oh my gosh, pull. this is every mathematician's yes. worst nightmare. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's, you know, pull it. Don't, yes, don't yes, hold the presses. Yes, absolutely. So in a way, what kind of works for Poincaré? Owning up to his mistake, if anything, enhanced Poincaré's reputation. He continued to produce a wide range of original work throughout his life. Not just specialist stuff either. He also wrote popular books extolling the importance of maths. Here we go, there's a section on the future of mathematics, which starts, if we wish to foresee the future of mathematics, our proper course is to study the history and present the condition of the science. So I think Poincaré might well have approved of my journey to uncover the story of maths. He certainly would have approved of the next destination, because to discover perhaps Poincaré's most important contribution to modern mathematics, I had to go looking for a bridge. Seven bridges, in fact. The seven bridges of Königsberg. Today, the city's known as Kaliningrad, a little outpost of Russia on the Baltic Sea, surrounded by Poland and Lithuania. Until 1945, however, when it was ceded to the Soviet Union, it was the great Prussian city of Königsberg. Much of the old town, sadly, has been demolished. There's now no sign at all of two of the original seven bridges and several have changed out of all recognition. This is one of the original bridges. It may seem like an unlikely setting for the beginning of a mathematical story, but bear with me. It started as an 18th century puzzle. Is there a route around the city which crosses each of these seven bridges only once? Finding the solution is much more difficult than it looks. was eventually solved by the great mathematician Leonard Euler, who in 1735 proved that it wasn't possible 
there couldn't be a route that didn't cross at least one bridge twice. He solved the problem by making a conceptual leap. He realised you don't really care what the distances are between these bridges. What really matters is how the bridges are connected together. This is a problem of a new sort of geometry of position, a problem of topology. Many of us use topology every day. Virtually all metro maps the world over are drawn on topological principles. You don't care how far the stations are from each other, but how they're connected. There isn't a metro in Kaliningrad, but there is in the nearest other Russian city, St. Petersburg. So the topology is pretty easy on this map. It's the Russian I'm having difficulty with. Can you tell me which... Uh, what's the problem? I uh, want to know uh, what uh, station this one was. 